Welcome to the No More Late Fees podcast. I'm Danielle. And I'm Jackie. And we're just two best friends and ex-Blockbuster employees re-watching some of the best and worst movies from the late 90s and early 2000s. This week, we are talking about the 1998 American action comedy film, The Big Hit. But before we dive in, let's get into some housekeeping. If you love the podcast and want to support us, here are a few ways that you can. Did you know writing a review or rating us helps us get more listeners? And we have a review. The title is fantastic. More than a blast from the past, this podcast covers all the best and worst from the 90s and 2000s. Danielle and Jackie are hilarious and so informative as they take you through your weekly nostalgia hit. Thank you, Mr. Mark P37. (laughs) Yay, that was so kind. Yeah. If you want to be featured and help us grow, head to Apple, Spotify, Podchasers, iHeartRadio, Good Pods, or your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review. Well, if you like what you hear, like Mr. Mark did, you can head over to ko-fi.com slash no more late fees and buy us a virtual cup of coffee. Or you can head to our Redbubble page and buy some merch at no more late fees.redbubble.com. And we'll be dropping some new merch, so definitely head on over and check that out. If you are fans of our Just Friends episode, our Hitch episode, what else we got, Danielle? Um, It wasn't Uh, Home Alone because we haven't done that, but it was something Something we we said. Yeah. (laughs) So new design alert, head on over to nomorelatefees.redbubble.com and check it out. Well, let's talk about this movie, The Big Hit. (laughs) So affable hitman Melvin Smiley is constantly being scammed by his cutthroat colleagues in their life-ending business. So when he and his fellow assassins kidnap the daughter of an electronics mogul, it's naturally Melvin who takes the fall when their prime score turns sour. That's because the girl is the goddaughter of the gang's ruthless crime boss. But even while dodging bullets, Melvin has to keep his real job a secret from his unsuspecting fiance Pam. It stars M- Mark Wahlberg, Lou Diamond Phillips, Christina Applegate, Avery Brooks, Bakim Woodbine, Antonio Sabato Jr., Lainey Kazan, Elliot Gould, Sab Shimano, Leela Rashan, and China Chow. It was directed by Kirk Wong. The screenplay was by Ben Ramsey, and you can currently watch it on HBO Max. But before we start, let's get into our ratings rewind. So you know the drill. Before we get into the movie, we'll reveal the rating our Y2K versions of ourselves would give. Then at the end, we'll see if our current selves agree with our initial rating. Our scale consists of would buy it, would buy it again. The best would play on repeat. Five-day rental. Would watch again. Two-day rental. Okay, but nothing to write home about. And same-day rental. Trash. Straight up trash. You're going to show up on the big top videos non-returner list. (laughs) All right, well, what was your rating, Jackie? So I have not seen this movie probably since the early 2000s, but Y2K Jackie was obsessed Owned it on VHS. I even told Ken going into it, like, I was obsessed with this movie. I recall. So, uh, I recall. definitely a would buy for me. I know you made me watch this movie. That's all I got to say. I, re- <laughs> I remember you when you had the, when you got the VHS. I remember that. And I think going in, <laughs> I was very excited to see this movie because at the time, you know, the lineup of the dudes were hella hot. Blue Diamond Phillips. We go way back. <laughs> way back. That's my boo thing. That's a boo thing that I didn't remember was my boo thing. You know what I'm saying? Like this yeah. movie, prepping for this Prep a while back. Feelings. Yeah, well, like knowing that we were adding it to the lineup and then I like tweeted and then he retweeted and I almost died. So Yeah. Love me some Lou Diamond Phillips. At the time before I learned of Mark Wahlberg's indiscretions and P37, 
pure racism, mm-hmm. uh, was feeling him and his Calvin Klein's. But I think what was like the top priority at that time, because I was a huge General Hospital fan, was my boy, Anton- Antonio Sabato Jr. Whew, he's barely in the movie. He is. But he but gives it, us stuff. He gives <laughs> us what gives, we need. He gives <laughs> us ash. He gives us smiles, dimples. Okay. So... Yeah, I was hyped. I remember being hyped about the movie, but I know I've never, I've saw this movie once and that was it. So I'm giving it a two day rental. I said all that to give it a two day rental because I remember it barely, but I also remember being excited about seeing it initially. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Well, why don't you tell us about the box office for this movie? I I need to go back and see like what else was came out when this movie came out because I can look while you're the budget was 13 million dollars for this movie and it made 27 million dollars so it wasn't like a hit hit but it made its money back so that's always important it debuted it debuted number one at the box office and the cool thing is that this movie was produced by film partners John Wu, Terrence Chang and Wesley Snipes. But it did get very mixed reviews from some of our faves. Jack Matthews at the Los Angeles Times wrote, the big hit, which was brought to Wesley Snipes production company by Hong Kong legend John Wu, attempts to take the East-West merger even further. And the result is an only fitfully funny comic mongrel. Now, remember, like at this time, this was when Rush Hour came out. This was when we were seeing like Jackie Chan was having his like crossover moments at this time. This is we start to get into like Jet Li coming in. And so we're starting to see a lot more. And and John Wu, of course, like his movies, you know, face off all those movies. He had such a huge a contribution at the time Mm -hmm. for action movies like the everyone knows the doves flying scenes every (laughs) time there's about to be like a huge fight so action movies were this was this was their time yeah but our boy Raj which I'm wearing my little Raj shirt shirt. (laughs) shout out to Roll Call and Bria and Simone So Roger Ebert said, I guess you could laugh at this. You would have to be seriously alienated from normal human values and be nursing a deep-seated anger against movies that make you think even a little, but you could laugh. I have to say, out of all the times that we've read anything that Lil Raj has said, that's one of the sickest burns I've seen him (laughs) put out. (laughs) Strength gangsta on this movie (laughs) yeah sick burn bruh sick burn i texted jackie yesterday and said i'm halfway through this movie but i had to take a break that's how well i got through rewatching this (laughs) i i really want to say much (laughs) like a kid in king arthur's court there's nothing wrong with this movie there's a lot wrong with this movie you know and i wasn't mad at it (laughs) i said lord please please talk to sister jackie because she can't she fucking can't like kid in king's arthur's court fine you were so young when that movie came you were young enough you were impressionable enough this there's no excuses Jackie there there's no excuses we'll talk about it. side eye bombastic side eye on this one <laughs> just going back to the dom- domestic box office for April 24th 1998 any guesses i only have the top 6 any guesses on what movies came out in yeah. 98 yeah what month 
April 24th, 1998. <laughs> I'm asking. <laughs> like, I know. I have no idea. I, I can't even guess. Tell me. Well, number one was still Let That Bitch Sing Titanic. Oh, that motherfucker's still going, huh? <laughs> number two, Polly the Bird Movie. <laughs> number three, As Good As It Gets. Okay. Number four, Primary Colors. Uh, Number okay. five, Mouse Hunt. You know what? People may sleep on that one, but I recall <laughs> that I, I laughed a little bit. <laughs> Just saying. And then number six was Amistad. Okay. It was an interesting box office time. So it I can was, see there was a really of competition. Polly. And there was nothing new that broke the top six. And Holly had been out for eight days, primary colors for 36. Yeah, it was not. These feel like September movies. Mm -hmm. Like if, you know, if you guys don't know, after the summer blockbusters, they start to creepily introduce all the oscar movies and stuff and so it's like the most boring time for the movies from then until christmas pretty much and this is april so we're probably they're holding back the good stuff until May. memorial day yeah, yeah. so I, it's a good time i guess <laughs> <laughs> so where to begin how about a thursday shall we because that's what the titles tell us. I will say that this movie had some really good music. Yes. Which is probably what got you. And also, Lou Diamond Phillips. <laughs> this fucking movie. <laughs> oh, I couldn't stand him in this movie. He's the only one who could act in this whole movie. And why is Mark Wahlberg look like he was doing the Kool-Aid challenge that we used to do in middle school to color our hair? There are a lot of questions that will be <laughs> answered in this episode, Danielle. So bad. Um, well, so our story begins. <laughs> we meet Melvin. He is picking up a body in trash bags. It's Sammy the Knife. I also have a... I, I'm sorry, Jackie, but be prepared. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt you a lot this episode because I have so many questions. Okay. What the brand name on them trash bags? Because I need them. They real adorable. He said they weren't because they were leaking. He said that he bought cheap ass trash bags. You know what? You're right. Though in that scene it was, but the ones that he has... It, it was a hitman special, Danielle. <laughs> well, you know what? And the ones he bought at his girlfriend's house because she brought it back. Yeah. Also, like, did she did she go and take those bodies out of the tub and put them in the trash? Like, she seemed to have no problems with these dead bodies. I mean, she put her foot in his mouth and said he looked kind of cute. Okay, yeah. All right, continue. <laughs> So obviously Melvin is doing a favor for his friend by disposing of this body. That's when we are in a house, which we find out is not Melvin's house. It's the house he has purchased for his girlfriend. Because <laughs> Melvin's Melvin doesn't want to upset anyone. He's got a cabinet, a medicine cabinet full of Maalox. He's got tummy issues. He says yes to everything, and he's banging two girls. Melvin needs some boundaries, and he's a <laughs> he's a major pushover. And Melvin loves love. He is trying to find love in other people instead of loving himself. He needs a therapist. And apparently, there is more of a backstory to Melvin to explain why. He wanted people to like him so much and why both of his parents were dead. But because of time and budgetary restrictions, that was cut out of shooting. With with how surface level this movie is, I don't think no. it was needed. 
it was not missed. It was fine, everybody. <laughs> so his girlfriend comes home, Chantal. And I like how she just like walks into the bathroom where he's like literally handling a dismembered body. And she's like, where directly the fuck have you been all week? She doesn't play. I miss the era of Layla Rashawn just being in all the movies. She's a fun actress. And she did a really good job in this movie just absolutely dragging Melvin. She did. And so she is fully aware what of what he does for a living and doesn't give a shit because she's paid for. Like her she got a car, she has a house, he pays the bills. But he's a little behind and we find out it's because he's too nice and is always doing favors and not getting compensated for them. And so <laughs> <laughs> then the next scene we see, she tells him that all the bills are past due and stuff. And he's like, okay. And she's like, we need $25,000 like ASAP. So he's going to find $25,000. So then we see him and his buddies getting ready for a job. So there's Melvin. There is Cisco, played by Danielle's beloved Lou Diamond Phillips. <laughs> we have Vince, played by Antonio Sabato Jr. Like we said, we get a good ass shot and maybe two lines from him. He's doing the Lord's work not arguing there <laughs> for for a second i was like could i take the locker scene and just like cops blur out <laughs> the booties and have that as my background and then we get crunch is that his name yeah i would say it's nice to see bokeem woodbine in a role where he is funny and just like you know, yeah, he's a hitman, but he, I mean, he plays a lot of gangster roles mm -hmm. or just, just these hard, tough guys. I'm sure he's probably always wanting to, to be able to play those roles, but unfortunately, you know, you get pigeonholed, especially as a black actor, but he was really fun in this movie, I thought. And uh, he played pranks on the set. So that locker room scene, he was stuffing his underwear as like a joke. But I remember looking and being like, that's a lot of junk in the front of his trunk. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, I, I just, his character was really the only one that was, well, no, Vince was actually friends with. Yeah, but. Know. No, but Vince also like went along with Cisco's fucking shadiness. Yeah. It felt like Crunch was the one who was actually Melvin's friend and willing to do things for him. But Crunch, it was such a dumb side storyline. <laughs> and I guess either I never realized what he was talking about when I was in high school watching this movie mm -hmm. or I chose to ignore it because it was so stupid. So apparently Crunch has just discovered... The art of, of self-pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and so he is now sworn off women. He's constantly using like exercise equipment. I don't know. To like He's trying strengthen to pump, his. Pump the iron for his hands. Yes. That's sad. And then later on we see he's like the top renter at big top video because he's been renting so much fucking porn to jack off to is that why yes <laughs> <laughs> i just thought it was like oh that's a funny insert but that makes even more sense and Be makes it sad because they show him talking on the phone with melvin and he's like rummaging through all the videos he has <laughs> I am so glad we did not rent anything like that at Blockbuster because gross. Like, I just don't want to handle those after you've handled those, sir. I knew this movie was written by a man mm -hmm. off the top when I saw this like 
side story of nonsense and just like oh the the ridiculousness of the women in this movie Mm -hmm. and then part of me was like I'm like this is probably a white man but I was also hoping that it would be a black man because there were uses of the n-word and I just like feel more comfortable I don't like it to be in movies Mm -hmm. I don't feel like it's necessary but I especially don't like it when a white like Quentin Tarantino when we get into his shit I'm going Mm -hmm. to a blood vessel will pop but it is a black man that wrote this movie because I had to look it up and so it makes some of the dialogue make more sense to me Mm -hmm. and also it makes sense on how some of the actors were acting in this movie yeah to fit this script well, um, apparently they wrote this movie with Martin Lawrence as Melvin in mind. If Matt Martin Lawrence had been in this movie, it would have like it still would have had cringy stuff, but it would have been 10 times funnier because I think Mark Wahlberg has grown into his comedic chops. Like mm-hmm. I I he has done movies where I'm like, "Okay, he's actually pretty funny." But not at the level of like Martin Lawrence. And in this role, he would like he was very soft spoken mm-hmm. and the range. There wasn't like a range with his acting really. He was flat to me the whole time. He was just flat. He didn't there there's so many opportunities that he could have made some of those instances funny and he did it uh, and I think he he nailed the whole like nice guy thing yeah and I think maybe that's what he was trying to go for with his kind of very (laughs) soft-spoken it just just didn't land at times I think that's all he could do it's like you know you can't he was like I can do this one thing yeah you know like there wasn't any nuance to it whatsoever so yeah and he was just so corny he was so corny but I don't think it was like he was corny because he was trying to be corny if you look at some of Mark Wahlberg's earlier works corny just saying yeah Ah. oh and we also get a line from Crunch as he's explaining to his friends (laughs) that he is now solo with his hand that he's been fucking since he was 10 (laughs) trauma alert like men women if you started to become sexually active at 10 something was going on there that you're a child but men in our society they talk about that as if like it's it's a good a thing point of pride yeah right and also the fact that he said like i've replaced having sex with jerking off meaning i don't and then he's pretty much said i don't need women you guys are wasting time on women really perpetuates the thought process that they don't look at women as being like whole people and mm-hmm. having like a partner in a relationship like the only valuable thing that being in a relationship or the whole point is to have sex. So I thought that was interesting that that's what like his viewpoint as he was talking while we have Melvin who can't, he's got two women. (laughs) And then a third. third. (laughs) Man, Melvin. So we see them all dress up as a construction crew They head to this high-rise building. They got to synchronize the watches in the elevator. And, like, it was literally, they all just put their arms out, kind of, like, Power Ranger style. And then (laughs) they were like, okay, let's go. It was weird. And then they head up to the penthouse. Crunch is in charge of snipping the electrical wire to make the the lights go out. There are so What? wouldn't you get the specs first to like Uh, when you're casing out the building you get the specs to know where to cut the wires like he seems surprised that there were so many to pick from 
or like the the whole like electrical boxes there just throw the breaker on all of it like whoa, just be whoa, like whoa 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 jackie you know i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> you, you sounded like ken right now <laughs> He didn't you... need to cut a wire. He could have literally just so in an electrical panel, <laughs> there are these things called breakers. And if you turn them off, it cuts off to the power to certain areas of the house. So, like right. if I'm hanging a fan in your house, right. I turn off the power to your bedroom so I can hang the fan and not electrocute myself. That panel I... was right there. <laughs> I only reference this because Ken and Jackie came to stay with me and Ken was doing some projects around the house and there is a light there's a few light switches that I don't I don't know where they're what they're for where they go whatnot so I just don't touch them and Ken was asking questions about well where is this supposed to go and I'm just like I have no idea (laughs) and he was perplexed that I wasn't curious as to why these switches don't work and so then he went to my box (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he figured out what it was supposed to be and I was like I I probably would, would die in this house and not know ever what that was so so side story <laughs> sorry we also get an absurd number of low angles in this movie like the cameraman must have been lying on the ground for the vast majority of this movie either to shoot them so they look big and imposing or so they could do a little flippy over the camera. There's lots of flippies. <laughs> There's lots of falling dramatically. Yeah. There's lots of shooting while jumping sideways. Yes. There's a lot of shooting that don't make sense to me. Cause I mean, I, I don't, I don't know physics and whatnot, but I feel like if there's two people shooting two separate guns at you and they shoot first and then you shoot a shotgun, how'd that blow up that whole table, blow up everybody and you didn't get shot by the two guns that were shot at you? Directly at you. Okay. You <laughs> think about that. Also, I have, I have an answer for you. <laughs> Okay. It's because like he shot and kicked himself backwards in the chair to to get out of the line of trajectory. They had already shot the guns before he shot. They all shot at the same time. (laughs) They just couldn't show all the guns going off at the same time if it's close-ups of all the guns. Whatever. (laughs) Also... I just want to know whoever was the costume designer did Mark Wahlberg a disservice. Those high water culotte pants he was wearing (laughs) in that first scene didn't make no sense. He looked so short because of it. Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I didn't specifically pay attention, but I did pay attention to the like, zip pullover at the end the yellow one where it had like finger guns <laughs> on it and i'm like if you don't want people to out like immediately know you're up to no good you probably shouldn't be wearing a jacket with fucking finger guns on it <laughs> that red hair gets me every time it's yeah, like it's good it does look like when you tried to dye your hair with red kool-aid <laughs> It also was like Ben Affleck's hair in Daredevil, but worse. Yes. I felt like if there had been a rain scene, it would just been like little (laughs) drippies of red down his face. A hundred percent. (laughs) Like if you are, for whatever reason, going to color your hair red, he should have bleached it first because what are we really doing? It was bad. Yeah, it was not stellar. (laughs) And this this fight scene, like, so he, they find out that they have to go after. I think it was like a mob boss. He was trying to buy three blondes under 20 for 50 grand each. <sighs> Just like, 
the women in this movie, no matter what stage, are the only yes, except for Chantal. Um, well, yeah, Chantal and Jeannie Shulman, because she running (laughs) shit. She ain't playing around. (laughs) But so they let. Sorry, they let Melvin just do all the fucking labor. Yes. And, and quite honestly, I was just like, I had wished all the other guys were just men of color because I'd have been like reparations. <laughs> <laughs> Melvin busts in. He has his night vision goggles on because we've cut the lights, right? Right. Night vision goggles on, guns blazing. And then he does these dramatic twirlies with the (laughs) curtains to let light in so that they're blinded because everyone, Ken goes, so just everyone has night vision goggles readily available to put on in case the lights go out. (laughs) Right, because they go in with the night goggles or whatever, and then the thousands of security guards that they have, they just like, go get the goggles. Like, they just, they don't even run anywhere. It just seems like they're right there, and they start putting them on. And they're just shooting up that place. I don't know how most of them didn't get shot up themselves. The girls get smart and run Mm -hmm. into the hot (laughs) tub. Oh, it's a like sunken a- in hot tub so it's at ground level and it's like that's the best place to be right now <laughs> it's just ridiculous and in my brain i was like does he like not see the hot tub and fall in because that would have been fantastic <laughs> like if he's just right. walking and all of a sudden he's just like in the hot tub with the girls unfortunately that did not happen <laughs> it's a missed <laughs> opportunity it really was yeah so yeah, he he lets the light in with and, and it was like very like <laughs> Electra's practice room curtains, like yes. very velvety lo- floor length curtains, and he's doing little spinnies <laughs> as he opens them. He's very theatrical in his killing. I just kept thinking for a minute. I, I'm not joking. I was like, did I misremember this movie? Is this a vampire movie? Because the, <laughs> the way. He's opening these shades as if it's going to like cause physical harm to these people. <laughs> I had to like, I was like, wait, I paused it. I had to like have a conversation. I was like, self, <laughs> did we really misremember this movie? Is this a vampire? <laughs> I was confused. <laughs> it was not a vampire movie. <laughs> it would have been better if it was. <laughs> If nice guy Melvin just stumbled upon a vampire nest and was like, hey guys, what's up? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to intrude. Maybe the red hair is supposed to be blood that is stained his hair or something. Maybe. Because- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he finally, like, like Danielle said, everyone else, Cisco, Vince, and Crunch, when he catches up with them. They're all just hanging out outside. They're having coffee, <laughs> non-dairy creamer. Like they're just killing time. And and Melvin's literally like, I need backup guys. And they're like, oh, we're coming in. And they're just, they're just like leisurely sipping. And they, sh- they do shoot the other dead bodies. I'm like, okay, does, do they have their own personal corner that gets these bottle bodies after cleanup? And checks the bullets to see, okay, yeah, these people actually, because why? I think it's just so that they can prove that they like fired ammo. Like you you can't (laughs) come back with the full clip. (laughs) It's just ridiculous. So Melvin does catch up with the mob boss, shoots him in the elevator, and then sets a bomb off and has to jump out of the fucking window of the penthouse does like a perfect swan dive into the swimming pool down below. I never understand this concept of, because I see it in TV shows, movies all the time. They bomb something and then dive, somehow dive into the the pool. First of all, again, I took physics. I barely passed, but you have to really figure out how like tall the what you're jumping out of into the pool 
and like the velocity of how far you're you're you know you're falling and how deep that pool is because right. if it's just a six footer you're hitting the bottom you're gonna die <laughs> and then if you don't die from the pool entry all of that shit that you just blew up there's a lot of debris that's falling mm-hmm. and you've got to like hope it doesn't hit you in the pool I know we're just thinking way too logically about an action movie, but that shit is really annoying. But and- we we bomb the shit out of the penthouse, but somehow the elevator with the dead mob boss is unbothered. <laughs> and so Cisco walks up. The guy is clearly fucking dead. And he goes, oh, he's still alive and shoots him like three times and then looks to Vince and Crunch and is like, he was alive, right, guys? And they're just like, yeah, whatever. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and so we get back to Paris's office, their crime lord boss. Avery Brooks, go ahead. Showed up on screen and, <laughs> and goes, Captain Cisco of Deep Space Nine. <laughs> as soon as I saw that he was in this, I was like, oh. We're going to talk about Star Trek, of course. (laughs) I didn't even watch Deep Space Nine, but I remember when they put a brother as the captain, I was like, whoa, whoa. I was very excited. Don't watch it. For those who couldn't hear because she spiked the microphone, she was making gun noises, pow pow noises, yet still not working. (laughs) You too high, Danielle. Sorry. So, and there was a twenty-five thousand dollar reward for shooting the mob boss man. And Cisco had been talking; he's going to buy himself a real nice boat and retire, and just sail around and shit. He he had a boat, but he wanted to be able to retire. Be- okay. Yeah, he had the boat already. He and he, <laughs> the way he gaslights M- Melvin. For this bonus and this isn't chunk change this is twenty five thousand dollars and he already knows his girlfriend is like you got bills that need to be paid. yeah oh i didn't miss at one point M- melvin is shot like in front of a window and he like does the jump out the window thing but catches himself himself with his legs and he does like a Michael Myers sit up <laughs> to start shooting again. I was like, didn't think that was going to come up again on the podcast, but here we are. <laughs> so, yes. And then this is where we what? go ahead. I just realized I'm so sorry. It just it's like dawning on me. Melvin's bitch ass lets Cisco gaslight him into giving him his bonus right Mm -hmm. crystal crystal is up his ass about this money this tall Chantel. sorry who who the hell okay i'm not even gonna do it (laughs) already not knowing characters names Chantel is already up his ass about it and saying like she needs exactly twenty five thousand dollars for whatever bills and expenses and so he does that gives it to cisco which puts him in a predicament later on because he now needs to do something stupid to get this Mm -hmm. said money instead of he like i don't i know he's a pushover but jesus why would you give that money away you know these people didn't help you He's just handing over his cash and drinking his Maalox. Yo, he's about to to have some real ulcers if he doesn't already have them. Yeah. So what now? He he goes home after this. Yeah, he goes home to the house he shares with his fiance, Pam, (laughs) who is Jewish and he is not. I have a problem with this because <clears throat> both the actors that play Pam, Christina Applegate's parents are Jewish, mm-hmm. but I, I could be wrong, but I don't believe Christina Applegate is Jewish. And I kind of feel like we don't get a lot of Jewish characters. 
in movies and TV. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it would have been nice if it was a Jewish actress to play the role. Now, the whole thought process or the inspiration for the character was the writer said he was thinking of Debbie Mazar, who is not Jewish. She's Italian, but that's who he had in mind for Pam. So that's my two cents about that. But I still love Christina Applegate, so I'm glad she was in it, but it would have been nice. She did a great job. Yeah, she brought the comedy, unlike some people. (laughs) She did. And as Melvin's walking in, the phone rings. And it is the clerk at Big Top Video. There's no way. (laughs) And he's literally, like, I can't even reenact it, but essentially he's, like, berating Melvin over the phone for not returning King Kong Lives. And he's had it out for too long. And there are kids crying because they can't rent King Kong. Like he's laying on fucking thick. And we did not guilt trip people into returning videos. But we did have, why can't I think of what it's called? Oh, we had the FOS. Here's our blockbuster story, Stephanie. So we had our, what we called the FOS list, which was found on shelf. So uh, like once a week, we would print a list of movies that were still outstanding. We would go out to the shelf, make sure they were not out on the shelf, like accidentally not scanned in and then put back out. And then we would take that list and it had the customers and their phone numbers on it. And we would have to manually call all the customers to, to let them know that they still had movies checked out as a reminder. I wasn't allowed to participate in this. <laughs> well, and I would get in such a routine of mm-hmm. like, hey, this is Jackie from Blockbuster and Wiles in university. You still have a goofy movie and Armageddon checked out. Please return these movies at your earliest convenience. Or if you can call us back and I would leave the phone number. Half the fucking time I left my own goddamn house number (laughs) and not the store number. And then I'd have to be like, oh, wait, I'm sorry. Not that phone number. And then say the right phone number. I did that. All the fucking time. (laughs) I'm surprised we never got a phone call at home. Like, hey, I still have (laughs) in and out, out. I'm sorry. I'm bringing it back today. My mom would have been like, okay, thank you. Those motherfuckers didn't care. That's why. That's yeah. why I didn't get calls. Really. There were some movies or games at our store that we just would never get back. And like, mm-hmm. I don't know why we never just ordered a new one, but like people would come and we'd be like, yeah, it's still not here. Sorry. Some of them are in moratorium, which means that they, you, it was unavailable to order. Gotcha. And then like, you're never we had like one copy of fifth element and it was such a cult classic that it was always checked out yeah and so you get like dumb yeah you get like the same kids every week like is fifth element here like they're (laughs) trying to watch and like sorry it was just checked out yesterday like they always like missed the small window where it was returned or something but yeah and we weren't because we were a corporate store we couldn't just like ad hoc like Right. Order stuff. We had to, uh, whoever the people were in the cloud making the decisions had to see like, <laughs> oh, fifth elements out all the time at one, two, one, seven, six. Maybe we should order more copies of that. And that just never fucking happened. I would hide movies. So, <laughs> <laughs> So we were able to see the movies like ahead of time, right? Before the new releases came out. But sometimes like if I just didn't get a chance and there was that sometimes it was that we didn't even get a chance to like see it before it came out. I don't remember, but Mm -hmm. I would hide them (laughs) in the family section (laughs) so that, and, and, you know, like I could see Jackie, like looking it up or one of our managers might be like, it says we have one in the store, but we can't find it. I'm like, you. there was a hot (laughs) firefighter that used to come to our store. And I remember, I don't, I think it was when Crouching Tiger came out when we were at the Glade store. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? If you come on Friday, I will have it for you. 
<laughs> and I did. I did have it for him. New releases did come out on Tuesday. So if you wanted to rent the hottest, <laughs> you had to be quick quick in the week. But a lot of people didn't come in until the weekend. And then they were pissed because they were rented out. Um, and then, yeah, we did have those firefighters. And they would literally sit in their fire truck waiting for calls. It was when we had the movie pass. Yeah, the movie pass. So it was $30. Yeah. And you could rent one movie at a time and you turn when you turned it in, you could get another one. Like it was just a flat rate and you got one movie out at a time. I sold those motherfuckers like hotcakes. <sighs> and I didn't I did lie not. about it. <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys ever wonder why I kept my job when I was sassy, it was because I was a selling machine. <laughs> And I was just like, oh, yeah, I, I, I got five sales on my shift. And it was because I put myself with Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we sold eight tonight. It was a hot night for a Tuesday. <laughs> really, it was just Danielle and me just shelving <laughs> movies and hoping that no one would talk to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But we did have the firefighters and they'd sit in their truck and they had the the movie pass. And so they would come in, rent a movie, go out to the truck, watch it while they were waiting for calls and then just go. And they would just sit in our parking lot. But I'm like, not mad at it. No, <laughs> not at <laughs> all. And I'm pretty sure it was like an entire fire station shared that one movie pass. So whoever was on duty <laughs> had the card and would just come in and rent stuff. Well, that was a rabbit hole. Why don't we check out one of our pod pals real quick and see what other podcasts you should check out. Mitra, if you could describe our show in one word, what would it be? Unrefined. That's the name of our podcast. So that's perfect. I'm BJ and that's Mitra and we have a podcast called Unrefined. Why don't you tell the people what it's about, Mitra? It's about paranormal, conspiracies, and just random silliness sometimes. Yeah, that's true. Random silliness is what we do best. But for real, guys, we do like to talk about the paranormal, creepy, spooky things that go bump in the night. Plus, we like to get into some conspiracies every once in a while as well. We have new episodes premiering every Monday and Wednesday and special strange stories on Friday. You can get those episodes wherever you download your favorite podcasts. Catch us on Paranormal TV Fridays, 9 p.m. Eastern. I think that just about sums it up. Do you think that that's the kind of promo that Danielle and Jackie wanted? If they get what they get. That's true. You guys have fun with us. We meet Pam. Pam comes in. Her ass is firm. She okay. This is again a man wrote this. Mm -hmm. She he like as soon as he sees her come in, he is like, oh yeah, and then she is like, here come feel this, which is her ass, and she's like, is it is it tight? Does it feel? You know how does it feel? And he's like, like a teenager's again, Mm. questionable, and they have some weird exchange. So she's really getting him all hot and bothered. Just so she can lay it on him that, by the way, my parents are coming through. I've invited them. So be ready for that. Yeah. And not only are they coming to visit, but, oh, you know that 50 grand we had in the bank? Well, they needed it for some shit, so I gave it to them. I think it was for their dad's business. Like, he had lost a bunch of money. And so she was like, so I thought I would give it to him to help him kind of jumpstart. Because I think at this point they've moved to the bedroom or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she kind of just lays that on him. And then they go As to bed. she's laying on him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't say anything about it, but they go to bed. And he has like a huge nightmare because now he's like, I don't even have that $50,000 to pull the $25,000 yeah. to give to Chantel. And he he panics and he yeah. calls what's his face? He calls uh, Cisco. I was gonna say Caesar. Yes, Cisco. <laughs> <laughs> he calls Cisco and says, you know, I'm in for because yeah. Cisco tells them that he has this off the books job. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't know what it is. He's assuming just killing more people, but we will find out that is not the case. So 
not only has Pam given 50 grand to her parents, but she has not told her parents that they are engaged. So that's another thing that they have to. And that he's not Jewish. Yes. Lots of fun to be had when the parents arrive. (laughs) And then we see a cut scene where Chantal is running a scheme. We find out she has her own man on the side. They're in like gold lame sheets. I love to see it. (laughs) (laughs) Let me just say everything about Chantal. I have no problems with (laughs) (laughs) and so she's just telling him how like essentially i don't think she's even behind on her bills it's just a way to get more money out of she's scheming yeah 100 percent. and so now it's friday we meet another member of the gang Mm -hmm. gump danielle i'm gonna have you describe gump why jackie that's your people (laughs) that is Um, your people so he is very much appropriating black culture very not dissimilar to kenny from can't hardly wait right oversized baggy clothes big chain the cadence and vernacular the kangle hat he this man with his full chest said the n-word yeah and if it wasn't for this podcast but again (laughs) i had to look up who wrote this and Mm -hmm. it made sense but i couldn't figure out who the actor was at first like it was really bothering me because he looked very familiar and then i remembered I'm trying to think what his name is. I had to find out what his name is, but I remembered who he was. He's the guy that was on, that was in Cruel Intentions 2 as Sebastian. Mm. He was just in a bunch of stuff, but like, I couldn't remember his name. He was giving Kevin Connolly vibes. <laughs> his name's me. His name is Robin Dunn, the actor. Okay. So Robin, why he had to do that? Yeah. You could have said... No, no, I'm not going to say this word. No. And Gump has a stutter, so it's very difficult for him to get words out. And he's nervous. And, when he's prepared, yes. he like seems calm. But once he gets rattled, yeah. Yeah, and Cisco makes him nervous all the fucking time. Yeah. Just with his energy <laughs> <laughs> that gold teeth is gleaming the whole movie I was like, <laughs> I <can't. laughs> there's nothing wrong with him <laughs> <laughs> so this is when we find out as they're on their way that this is a kidnapping it is not a hit they are kidnapping the college age daughter of the owner of Nishi Electrics. But then we we see that Mr. Nishi has made the most expensive movie ever made and he's broke. So they're kidnapping this daughter and to hold her for ransom because in their minds, he has this wealth of money, but he has spent it all. They I wrote down. They did not do their research at all. At all. Yeah. It, it it was giving very much the the very first episode of Shit's Creek. They're like taking all his stuff. Yep. And he still wants to send a stretch limo to go pick up his daughter. Yeah, from... keep up appearances. Right, which is she's supposed to be in college and it yeah. What were um, you looking for? Oh, the the title of the movie he made is <laughs> taste the golden spray and he starred and directed (laughs) for a moment for that title for business management skills because somebody like a financial manager should have said yes you want to make this movie but it doesn't need to be this expensive like and it bombed it bombed bad 
And then the promotional stuff, like, which is explained later, like just the movie posters and promotional items that he was sending to video stores and movie theaters and stuff was so extravagant and over the top, which also led to his financial demise. So Uh, he was... He was going to go pick up his daughter, but mm-hmm. I guess whoever was with him, I guess that's his financial manager said, well, I was going to say, he like said, I was going to send a limo and he's like, well, how much does it cost? So he gives him the money to send a limo to go pick her up from school. And that's mm-hmm. how the guys are like going to intersect and steal her away by pretending to be the limo drivers. So yeah. And they're, they pretend to be stranded on the side of the road so that the limo stops. It seems like it's a more rural road. And then they shoot the limo driver and then Melvin assumes the role of the limo driver to go pick her up. While they're waiting, though, he does ask Crunch if he can borrow $25,000. Crunch says yes. And so Melvin starts to feel like a teeny tiny bit better that he's going to at least be able to give Chantal <laughs> her money. Mm-mm. There is a throwaway line of Melvin saying, I can't stand the idea of anybody not liking me. And so that's kind of the crux of why he does all these things for other people and gets taken advantage of. <clears throat> and he has provided a picture of the girl and she is sitting and waiting for the limo to show up. She recognizes it's not her typical limo driver, but doesn't question it really. And then her smarmy ass boyfriend gets into the car with Is he her. her boyfriend or like, I never understood I their just... relationship, but he, he definitely is an asshole. But I do mm-hmm. want to take a second. So the character's name is Ke- Keiko. Is Kiko. that her name? Kiko. And this is the debut of China Chow. Prior to this, she had been an, a model. And I just kind of went into a deep dive about who she was. And mm-hmm. I wanted to read you a few things that okay. I found very interesting, illuminating even. Um, so she was born in London and her parents are Michael Chow and her mom is Tina Chow. Now her mom, Tina, was also a model and designer. Her dad... Do you know who he may be? I read who he was. Oh, okay. So he is a restaurateur and he owns Mr. Chow, which is a very famous restaurant, Mm -hmm. a chain, I think. I think there's multiple, if I'm not correct. And they're, and his dad has been married, her dad has been married like four times. Also, she is related to like, a lot of famous, like a lot of her relatives are famous, but I was interested in her aunt, who is Shay Chin. Shay Chin is an actress that as soon as I saw her picture, I was like, oh my God. So her aunt was in the Joy Luck Club. And what else was she in? She was also, she's been in so many things, but she was also in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., she played May's mom. Like she's just been, she's been an actor, actress for a long time. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. Like this whole family is just all interconnected. At one point, David Burns from the Talking Heads was her uncle beat through marriage. And she's currently dating Billy Idol and used to date Keanu Reeves. It, and she dated Mark Wahlberg after this movie for four years, which knowing his history is super weird, but agreed. I I digress. So yeah. Oh, she also dated Steve Coogan. So just like reading her history, I was just like, this is a lot. She a Nepo baby, didn't know that. And I don't know. I think I would feel like my life was not completed properly if i had keanu reeves in my clutches and then and then he is no longer in my clutches (laughs) (laughs) no offense to billy idol i will like i i very much enjoyed her in this movie like i think she did she outacted mark Wahlberg for sure wasn't hard to do (laughs) (laughs) and then she's one of my favorite 
there's so many favorite parts of head over heels but she was a a great part of head over heels she plays the best friend in that and so those were the two kind of standout roles in my impressionable y2k self (laughs) but i very much enjoy china chow china chow and she is beautiful yeah a hundred percent i think she did the best she could with the material that was given this was to me some dude's wet dream and fetish 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 fetishization oh i can't say words but fetishization fetish how do you say it fetishization (laughs) you can't say it either fetish you maybe you said it better than me hold on Fetish, fetishization, <laughs> fetishization, <laughs> fetishization. It's not an easy word to say, but <laughs> they said that her role was originally supposed to be a high school student and intentionally as a, a an homage to Asian school girls in anime cartoons. However, certain powers that be found it to be too risque and she is now a college student in the film. But to be honest, like, I know that they say she's in college, but just like her being in that schoolgirl outfit Mm -hmm. and just some of the things that they do in this movie just was ick. Yeah. (laughs) You know? So, yeah. 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 So back to the smarmy maybe boyfriend. So he is a straight up sexual assaulter. Yeah. Uh, who carries crystal in his, in his suitcase? suitcase and this is 1998 why does that suitcase look like he's going to hogwarts <laughs> <laughs> like a tree went to hogwarts in 1998 <laughs> danielle what are you insinuating <laughs> because <laughs> harry didn't harry had to buy a trunk like everybody <laughs> bought a trunk like that suitcase was not 1998 no, it was giving like 1950s housewife catching the train. <laughs> you know what? It was Chronicles of Narnia. Yes. Suitcase. Yeah, but he had his very sp- expensive, <laughs> fragile crystal in a fucking suitcase. It is make any sense. The privilege. Yeah. And so she's fighting for her life in the backseat because yes. he's trying to like get some and sexually assault her which i don't understand that he like rips her shirt pretty much open right Mm -hmm. but then later on we just see magically buttons and everything are fine again just that bothered me well and okay so she's not i mean she's saying no and she's kind of like get off me blah 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 like almost like a damsel in distress type thing yeah. To the point where Melvin pulls over, shoots Lance, and then continues driving. But later on in the movie, she's very like calculated in how she's going to get out of her kidnapping situation and not afraid to be like knocking people out and shit. Like, yeah. So it was very weird the two like dichotomies of like how she handled the Lance situation and then how she handled the Melvin situation later. Well, I think the land situation has probably some social aspects of it. Mm-hmm. Like we don't know who his family is, what's what repercussions she may have at school mm-hmm. with him. So there might have been some reasons maybe why she was a little bit more hesitant to be as violent as she should have been with him. Not just scared of like the physical violence of it but mm-hmm. maybe the social repercussions that might have came with yeah, this dude or the retaliatory mm-hmm. yeah i really love the line like later a little later on when melvin finally pulls over at like where he was meeting the rest of his crew where he's like sorry you shot your boyfriend he was kind of rude <laughs> <laughs> melvin is living in a whole nother life a whole other fantasy <laughs> team pretty much and this scene yeah coming up <laughs> china ate fucking up <laughs> she's she calls them the spice boys <laughs> <laughs> 
And then they have this ransom note she, they want her to read. And there's like shit spelled wrong. So she's reading it. <laughs> she's like, you told me to read it exactly how it was on the note. Like she get cops attitude with him. And I, I think <laughs> Lou Diamond Phillips makes, he, he does such a good job in this movie. I know he's cringy in his character, but that man took, very little direction he probably got in in that script and he still made it his own like he made yeah. me legitimately laugh because he was so ridiculous in this movie they mean businesses Who <laughs> <does this? laughs> he, he gets frustrated enough he just rewrites it and says dad you know you you better pay this money or they're gonna kill me and that's what yeah. like kind of drove home yeah so then they decide they're gonna take her to Chantel's house because she knows that melvin's a hitman and they need like a safe space to kind of stash her and Chantel's still like harassing him about the money he's like look right. i'm gonna get it later so she, he leaves her in his in her basement or something i guess and then he goes back to his house Mm -hmm. And that's when we see that Pam's parents are there now. Yes. And so we meet Ross and Rachel's dad mm -hmm. and, Fra <laughs> and Fran Fine's aunt. <laughs> oh, from I the always nanny. think of her as, as Bloom's mom from Beaches. Uh, or Tula's mom oh, from yes. My Big Fat Great Wedding. Which we are all, we're referencing Lainey Kazan. Yes. Yes. Uh, so. so then we see the rest of the guys are kind of in their hideout. I don't, I don't know what it is. All I know is it's a Kwanzaa hut, Danielle. I'm going to teach you something new today. <laughs> okay. So the building that they are in are, are military buildings from like the 1950s, I believe. I could be wrong in that and Ken will correct me. But they are like a circular shaped metal buildings mm -hmm. you've seen them before but they have a name they're called kwanzaa huts and so i was very proud that i could be like that's a kwanzaa hut anyway so that's where kind of like cisco and gump are hiding out gump is explaining the trace buster and the trace buster <laughs> buster so let me get this straight you guys are stealing from essentially the man who's like the owner of like sony or yeah you know a tech company mm -hmm. and you think you're going to outtrace him mm -hmm. how how dumbasses but they place that call to solidify the the instructions for the kidnapping and the dad is about to commit suicide in a very traditional japanese way the from what i've seen in other movies ken knew the 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 name like he immediately was like blah 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 and i was like uh, i don't know what word you said Tell, <laughs> let me we're both typing away trying to find out the name seppuku seppuku yeah okay so yes dad is very distraught has lost all his money is about to commit seppuku and then the phone rings so he answers it but Gump cannot get out what needs to be said. And so the dad kind of brushes it off as a prank call hangs up. They have to call back. They play the message from the, the daughter. <laughs> and the dad goes into a panic and calls his BFF, who happens to be <laughs> Paris, the hitman's boss. They so did they have do research properly. They did sorry. Not. They have inadvertently kidnapped their crime boss's goddaughter. <laughs> Plot twist. <laughs> Just idiots but i do love this scene where he's trying to play the ransom and just the most random things on this tape player keep coming out because they did not plan accordingly of course. Yep. They they did not cue it up. And so as 
as he's saying, like, you need to do the ransom or whatever, he could just repeat, like, he could have just said that, but I, I know they had, he had to prove that they had the daughter. But he, as they're doing it, the father has his own track buster or whatever machine and is tracking the call. Trace buster, buster, buster. Yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. So he gives the number, I, I'm assuming, to Paris. And Paris then calls Cisco and tells him to bring his ass. I do love that Cisco has these like tailored suits, even with like that mesh shirt under it, but they're like short. The, the <laughs> just the style of it, it's it's very interesting. That shirt he wears <laughs> behind you, and then for the rest of the movie, it's like a mesh, but it has like an applique, <laughs> like. I don't, it, it almost looks like a painting like a renaissance painting or something applique on it very popular in the 90s i think there's a similar shirt or design i guess you could say in 10 things i hate about you that gabrielle union's wearing and at that shirt actually you could see it on lorelei gilmer like many people wore that shirt in different movies so this was this, a, this was a style. This was giving me Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. It was. <laughs> it, it, it very much was. <laughs> I, I would have preferred to see Lou Diamond Phillip in that movie instead of John Leguizamo. Um, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Danielle's hot take of the episode. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love that I've gotten two theme songs today. <laughs> <laughs> off the top of your head Woo-hoo. <laughs> so Harris calls an emergency meeting because now he wants to hire his boys to go rescue his kidnapped goddaughter so Sis- Cisco has to start scheming <laughs> because he he has to play both sides now and they have to have a fall guy and so that fall guy ends up being Melvin. Surprise, surprise. And Gump. So, well, first the fall guy is Gump, and then it leads them back to Melvin. So while this meeting is happening, Melvin shows up at home, or Melvin's at home meeting the parents. They tell him that he's a very nice German-Irish fella. <laughs> And while mom and Pam are like off talking, the dad's like, hey, can you give me a shot of rum? <laughs> so there's like a rule that the dad cannot drink and we find out why later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that scene is ingrained in my brain. <laughs> so mom and Pam are continuing to argue about things. In this argument, I would like to note that the mom is like really saying, look, this isn't going to work. You can't marry this guy because he's not Jewish. It's just, it's not, it's not a thing Mm -hmm. that you need to do. You're giving your father a heart attack. Dad doesn't give a shit. But then when Pam like continues to fight with her mom, she's like, well, you know, you keep this up. I'm going to marry a black guy. How about Mm. that? Would you like that? A big six foot, like I'm listening to this and I'm just like, Try to make it through this fucking movie. Yeah. Yeah. But a black man wrote this again. So I'm sure he is projecting Mm -hmm. things that are real. Yep. To to his his experience. And so that is the again, I, I I don't love it. But there I'm getting... is some sort of perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now it's Saturday. They play Save Ferris and the world is new. And you ever have those moments where you haven't heard something in 20 years, but then you immediately know all the words as soon as it starts playing? Because that was me with this song. Yeah. I heard, is that Jimmy Ray? Who wants to know? that song and i haven't heard that shit it's so long and it what opened song up a... is that? <laughs> are you johnny ray who wants to know are you so and so i don't know who wants to know 
blah, blah, blah. Who wants to know? Who wants to know? Who wants to know about me? It's called Jimmy Ray. <laughs> it is called Jimmy Ray. Okay. So the world is new. <clears throat> and Chantal has had enough of Melvin's shit because he hasn't getting, gotten her her money. And so she drops off Kiko, 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 and the dead man's body parts on the front doorstep of his and, home. And these are the good trash bags. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> later on the there's a dog trying to rip it apart and i'm like how did this dog not penetrate through the, the through this garbage bag at this point it's hefty tough <laughs> so and and it's like this whole scene where he's trying to avoid the parents and pam and dispose of the body that's in garbage bags on his front step and also, Kieko's hopping through the house and he's having to like hide her and is trying to lock her in the bathroom and do all of these things. So it's like this whole like he's running around like a crazy person trying to make sure prevent people from seeing <laughs> shit. And I just feel like a different actor would have made this scene even more funny. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there was no like physicality. It was mm -hmm. literally just like, run over here, run over here, run over here, you right. know. And even when he told Pam, like, don't go into the bathroom, like, mm -hmm. essentially, I just took a shit. He was just like, oh, it's stinky. Like, he just. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, I, it was like, not even. Yeah. If Christina Applegate got the chance to do that scene, it would have been hilarious. Yeah. He finally gets the garbage bags into the trash can. He throws Kiko in the back of their SUV. And as he's like closing the door, he like hits her in the head with the door and like knocks her out. So she's knocked out in the back seat or in the back storage area of their SUV. Big top video calls again to harass him some more about <laughs> King Kong lives and apparently the video store kid was only a voice in the script. He was never seen until the end of the film. However, when Danny Smith was hired, it was decided to insert his scenes into the film and introduce him physically earlier. And I mean, out of he, all of the comedic stuff, nailed it. Yeah, he did a good job. He did. So it was decided that Pam is going to take her parents to Temple and but they take the suv and like he goes still in the knocked back. out in the back and so scott scott <laughs> melvin is trying to figure out how to get her out of the back and he's just like oh and he had told pam that there was deer meat in the trash bags yeah so she thinks someone went hunting and like gifted him all this deer meat and he told them that he would make them a kosher meal while they were gone too. Yeah. But they leave. They actually leave mm -hmm. with her in the back. And he's like getting ready to go in the car to go try to stop them. And but then they come back because they had the dad had to use the bathroom or something. Mm -hmm. So that gives him the chance to go get her body. And he like wraps her up in a sleeping bag and brings her back inside. Yeah. And and so then he calls Crunch. And it was like, hey, I got a situation. I need you to come get this girl. And so Crunch is like, yeah, like, like, give me some time. I'll be there in about an hour and a half to come get her. So like Melvin has kind of solved a couple of dilemmas. He still needs to get the cash from Crunch anyway to give to Chantal. Uh Meanwhile, it, it's time for the like second ransom phone call to happen. And so they're all sitting around the Trace Buster 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 <laughs> at Kiko's dad's house. And, and Cisco's just standing there like, don't call, like, please don't <laughs> fucking call. <laughs> like, obviously they can trace him and Gump is like psyching himself up. Like I can do this, blah, blah, blah. Like writes out a script for himself. And so he, he 
flawlessly gets out like where the drop needs to be, all of that stuff, but they need to keep him on the line for 30 seconds to get his phone number. And so the dad's kind of playing dumb, like, I don't understand what you're saying. And and then Gump's stutter starts to come back into play because this is not what he had rehearsed and he's panicking. But then it's like that 30 second mark hit. And he's like, oh, yes, I understand. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so then they they're able to find him and go bust up into his house. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> this is when Cisco does an interrogation and because all of them are watching him do this. And so he's like, who sent it? sent you and who who's who are you working with and every time he's like hitting and roughing him up he's like melvin he's just saying melvin like (laughs) under his breath and then finally gump is like melvin and let's not let's not dismiss the fact that the writer of this movie probably named him gump after forrest gump yeah 100 percent and so he roughs him up. He finally gets him to say Melvin. And the way, the over top, the over the top way that Cisco's like, Melvin, like our Melvin to everyone else who's in the Clutching room. Clutching his pearls. Right. <laughs> and then he like knifes Gump. He mm-hmm. throws him on the counter and kills him. Poor Gump. Poor Gump. But he's, you know, he said the N word, so I'm fine. He did say the N word, so. <laughs> Meanwhile, at Melvin's house, Kieko is now awake and she's like, I have to go to the bathroom. You're going to have to help me. So a this very scene. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hold on. I have to <clears throat> prepare. I don't. There are some things that I never thought could be sexualized that are sexualized in this movie. Cool. Uh, one being Melvin having to help her take her panties down so she can pee. Which, by the way, there's no wiping and there was no hand washing. Just, Mm -hmm. you know, these are, you know how I feel about the washing of the hands and the bathing. (laughs) And she, she's like, oh, so Chantal's your girlfriend, but you're engaged to Pam. Do you want to tell me more? Like, (laughs) so he has fixed her, reheated her pizza, is feeding her now. And they're having like this, like real deep discussion about why Melvin has the need, feels the need to like please everyone and have everyone like him. Yeah. And she tells him like, oh, you're not like the other guys and, Mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you deserve better. You need to do better, whatever. And then slowly but surely, she just keeps on getting him to like, he uncuffs her at one point because now he's she's helping him cook this kosher meal and so he's not not even guarded at at all she he takes off of the things tied around her her feet and like she drops sauce on her leg and it's just it's so not just not a turn on it's so i get my like i go i do that shudder where i'm like i literally wrote sexual chicken stuffing right (laughs) they're like massaging a whole chicken together and again i did not see anybody wash their hands salmonella people and how does that chicken get on fire i don't know i don't think that too like yeah and in that short period of time, okay, Miss Terry dries out the turkey every year for Thanksgiving and that shit is in the oven for like eight hours and does not turn black and catch on fire. So this chicken being <laughs> wherever it is spontaneously combusting in three minutes makes no goddamn sense. Yeah. But it felt like they were trying to have a ghost like pottery moment. <laughs> Oh, with stuff and chicken, dude. <laughs> it was icky. I was uncomfortable, but I told Ken, I'm like, I'm pretty sure Y2J- Y2K Jackie was into the chicken stuff. <laughs> Jackie, no. <laughs> because I shipped them when I was younger. And like, yeah, they were meant to be. Jesus, Jesus. We've heard um, some things. <laughs> the song that plays during their every time they're together, like when it's mm-hmm. like love time, 
I I know I heard that song from this movie. It had to be. Also, like, I just wanted to state that again. He helped her use the bathroom. She used the bathroom, and they did not both wash their hands to massage this chicken. <laughs> just wanted to make that abundantly clear. Not that we saw. Girl, bye. They didn't wash their hands. <laughs> There's no way. So, yeah, once she spills the stuff on her leg, the chicken marinade on her leg, and he's, like, wiping it up for her in a very Ugh. sexual manner. He took and so long. Sorry. He did. <laughs> like, and, like, lifted her onto the counter, but then didn't even stop there, like, spun her. So she was laying flat out on the counter. Didn't it give you very childlike situations? Like, him the way he lifted her it just felt like something a, a father would do for a little kid or like they or, skin their knee and let me yeah. help you yeah it was just it there's so many creepy vibes <laughs> in this whole scenario so then while he's wiping up her leg which she is fully capable in doing because she's not handcuffed she <laughs> she's not she, her feet are not bound He's taken her gag off, everything. She hits him in the head with a mallet. <laughs> yeah, but they 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 get from one countertop to another countertop. And now they're like, sh- some reason she's laid out on the countertop and he's going in to make out with her at this point. And she hits him with the mallet. And which- she runs screaming at this point, which I'm like, girl, were you playing a long game? Because bravo, if you yeah. were. I was happy. But I was like, if she doesn't... If she hadn't done this, I would have been like, "I this character, I'm done with it." Yeah, yeah. He he very quickly catches her. She does not <laughs> get far. She gets to the living room. <laughs> um, she he does really apologize. What? She doesn't really knock him out. She just hits yeah. him. Yeah, he does apologize, and then that's when he goes back in, and the chicken is already burnt. <laughs> Don't and understand. he has to order kosher food to mm-hmm. pretend that he made that instead. Yeah. Where does he put her? Back in the car? Back in his, think, in the back of his car. Yes. Yeah. 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 So now we see mom and Pam are returning home with dad. <clears throat> they went and got their hair done. And I guess while at the hair salon, mom has convinced Pam to break up with Melvin. Right, she's coming, they're going to have dinner and pretend like nothing's happening, but then like, I think the next day she's going to break up with him. At this time, Crunch does call and tells Melvin, you need to get out of Dodge. They're coming for you, bro. Mm -hmm. And so I'm actually surprised they didn't stop at Chantal's house first Mm -hmm. and they go to Melvin's house first because that's where they knew they were going to stash the girl was at Chantal's. Yeah. So he gets in the car Melvin gets in the car and he's like, I'm I'm gonna roll out. But then he sees a picture of his girl, Pam, and I think he feels guilty. And by the yeah. time he gets back in the house, he because like while he's in the car, he's hearing them come like come to the house and try to get in and and saying that they're co-workers of Melvin's. He walks back in the house and they're all seated, ready for this lovely kosher dinner that Melvin has prepared. So it's Cisco, a couple of Paris's other goons, <laughs> and then mom, dad, and Pam. But they didn't know that dad has been raiding the out the liquor. He's it's been a- putting it in his prune juice. Yes. So instead of pimp juice, it's prune. <laughs> it's juiced up prune juice. Melvin does have an arsenal hidden behind his like tools on the wall in the garage so he does stock up layer up that's when he puts that ridiculous windbreaker zip up on with the finger guns so he walks in cautious dad proposes a toast (laughs) it starts fucking ranting about mom and her two hundred thousand dollars of cosmetic surgery and how ridiculous she looks. He says that she's an animal. Like, it's very degrading. Like, yeah. the mom isn't the best moral, morally sound person. Yeah. But the way that he talks about her is just, like, really fucked up. And the way he talks about his daughter. Just, like, calling them money-grubbing 
Bitches. Yeah. And then he says Melvin is charming in a Rain Man sort of way. (laughs) I shouldn't have laughed at it, but it was just like, wait, what? (laughs) So meanwhile, while dad's in his drunken (laughs) toast rant, all of the men seated at the table have guns pointed at Melvin, and Melvin has a sawed-off shotgun pointed under the table at them. And so dad stumbles a little bit, happens to take the tablecloth with him, which we find out is a, it's a glass table, and you can now see all the guns pointed at everyone. And this is where Danielle had very much confusion. Yes, well... The dad throws up on Cisco. Yes. <laughs> and this is when Melvin. I don't want to say it's a Han shot first scenario, but I really don't. I really don't know who shot first because my recollection is that the guy shot first, but it's a movie, Danielle. It's a movie. It's a movie. <laughs> But there is a shootout. Yeah. And somehow Pam and her parents are not injured in the flying bullets that happen. Yeah. Um, and they're going at each other. Melvin is able to get away. Um, well, so Melvin, there are two lines in this whole scene that really stick with you. <laughs> Number one, when he says to Cisco, we were supposed to be friends. <laughs> Jesus. And number two, when Pam and her mom are crawling across the floor to get to safety, and he kind of leans over as he's like pointing a gun at Cisco, and he's like, Pam, were you really going to break up with me? <laughs> <laughs> and she's just like, Yeah, bye. <laughs> I'm mad that the mom at one point said, Do you think he's going to make you give the money back? It's Fifty thousand yes. dollars. Y'all are tripping. You weren't mm. even married. Like, and that's when Melvin gets in the he gets to the car and he's trying to get out. He shoots out a few of the tires and they have like a shootout. What or kind of car chase. does he drive? Don't, don't don't know. <laughs> it's yellow. It's a yellow car. It it's looks a, old. It's a yellow Pontiac Firebird. Okay. You're welcome. I knew you were going to ask. I just don't (laughs) care to know. My favorite is, as they're chasing Melvin, there's only one Chrysler minivan that didn't have the tire shot out. And so it's like 15 guys hanging out the side (laughs) of this minivan. It looks fucking ridiculous. And it made me laugh so hard. But now they're chasing Melvin at the same time, we we see Chantal. She was skipping town. She was going to take the money she's already grifted from Melvin. And she's the one who has King Kong Lives. And it's in a briefcase. The money in King Kong Lives is in a briefcase. But she, why? That's what she We don't. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Chantal's, Chantal's boyfriend is driving. And he's apparently made four left turns or something. She's pissed because they're supposed to be like riding off into the sunset (laughs) and they're right back where they started. And oh, wouldn't you know, Melvin sideswipes them. (laughs) The briefcase with the money and King Hung Lives goes flying. Nico goes, that was intense. Like, girl, bye. I, I... You know this man's a hitman, right? That was intense, bitch. You have been kidnapped and they're trying to kill you. Was it also intense when he shot Lance in the head earlier right. today? Anyway, <laughs> Chantal thinks she broke her leg and then Melvin gets out of the car, walks to over to Chantal and is like most upset that she was going to keep the video store movie (laughs) and that's the deal breaker for him it seems honestly it was his responsibility to know where the fuck he had that movie and he should have returned it so i think she took it from her house and took it to the boyfriend's house i don't know he should have taken it back as soon as they watched it thumbs thumbs the rules (laughs) 
So at the same time, the Melvin and Chantal crash, the minivan also crashes. And wouldn't you know, Cisco emerges from the flames of that crash <laughs> and is now ready to fight Melvin. Also, Paris and Keiko's father are in the limo. So the, like, they crash too. Cisco and- steals Chantal's car. Right. And now they're chasing Melvin and Keiko. Right. And, Mel- and Melvin and Keiko, are, they pull up to the damn video store. And he's like, look, I'm going to go in real quick. And they establish their love for each other. And that she's mm-hmm. ride or die. She want to be with him. And starts calling him Skipper for some reason. Uh, Jesus. And then they take the time, mind you, people are still trying to kill them, to like start making out. And then here comes Cisco crashes crashes into their car and their car over a cliff it lands on a branch that is conveniently hanging out the side of a cliff (laughs) and so melvin gets kiko to safety and is like i guess meet me at big top video i got shit to do yeah and this forest chase scene is just insane he outruns a car flip (laughs) <laughs> Cisco, sur- Cisco survives the car exploding by a convenient lake next to him Ken it's says, just ridiculous that's the strongest jaguar ever <laughs> it's, it's literally plowing down like full grown fucking trees and just taking them out yeah and at one point as Cisco is chasing Melvin Cisco is in a car Melvin is on foot Melvin drops King Kong lives and so he has to like run back and get it before Cisco. It was it's a whole fucking thing. It's a mess. But the scene that they do this car chase in in the forest was filmed in a public park in Pickering, Ontario, Ontario, and the it's like it's like a small suburb near Toronto. It took place for like two weeks that they were filming and the neighbors, the residents of the town were like really upset because they weren't allowed to go near the park when they were filming. So they were pretty pissed about this. Fun oh, fact. apparently when when he drops King Kong Lives, this is a trademark Mexican standoff <laughs> shot that John Wu John Wu always uses in his movies. So that was the homage to that. Yeah. But um, he didn't direct this movie but was a producer as we said yes. before. And so now Melvin returns his video to Big Top Video and the kid is still fucking mm-hmm. harassing him. Like let's look at them late fees. Oh, it wasn't rewound. <laughs> Let me charge it for that. And then Cisco shows up. And this is when we get the hand-to-hand combat scene. <laughs> and this video store is two stories. I've never seen a two-story video store. I've only, I, okay, I've only seen it for like, like a pure retail. In Times Square, there used to be a virgin store Mm -hmm. and it had like movies and 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 music i wonder if some of the other block like the really big blockbusters back in the day would have would be something like this because they used to have one dave matthews there's a video going around of dave matthews actually performing at a blockbuster Mm -hmm. that they had and it was like a blockbuster music and video or something one of those hybrid things because some of the stores had like nickelodeon rooms or something i think so we just never had any of those stores near us, but I think there were some specialty blockbuster stores back in the day. Yeah. So maybe there was a two story one, but like uh, maybe like a FYE or something like that I could see, but not I a just, rental store. I just keep thinking like, I wouldn't want to walk up and down those stairs all day shelving shit. First of all, nobody else was working there except him. Yeah. He That's was very true. dedicated. I didn't see not another person shelving nothing. And all I kept thinking in this fight scene, because they are tearing up this video store, is like, oh my God, who's going to clean this up? Yep. (laughs) Who's going to put all these, who's reshelving this shit? What would you do if we had a scenario like this? Someone came and just fucked up the store. 
<sighs> I'm not cleaning. I'll, I'll do the same thing that I did when that kid sharded all over the video games. I, it's not my job. I ain't cleaning that up. Ain't cleaning it up. <laughs> You can't pay me enough. To <laughs> I, clean this up. And I sure didn't clean that shit up. Mike went to Publix and he cleaned it up his damn self. <laughs> so Melvin finally stabs Cisco with his own knife. They're on like this giant rig of lights in the middle of the store, like up on the second story. And up until the very end, Cisco is playing him because he's like, I can't see. <laughs> like laying it on real thick but melvin has another bomb strapped to his chest and so like cisco is just laying around thick enough where he can like activate the bomb and then now he's dead but melvin has a fucking bomb strapped to him so he ends up running out of the store he throws it runs out of the store and then as soon as he runs out of the store he sees paris with a gun ready to shoot him also Keiko has run out of the forest to come yeah. like make out with him and then he's like oh shit and he runs back into the store and then the store blows up but Cisco was like I'm, if I'm gonna die you won't die too kind of situation but Melvin is so naive all the way to the last moment yep with this Melvin runs back into the store store explodes Keiko is very sad his little warrant photo for having a late movie flutters to her feet i wish we could do (laughs) that shit like i wish we could shame our customers in this way to literally take a picture now i will say that there is a certain movie theater it's no longer open in new york and my picture may have may or may have not been up because I was I'm banned. Sorry, what? I was banned from that movie theater. Hi. Um, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you another day. <laughs> it is not safe for the puck. <laughs> 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 okay. But I they had a wall of pictures of people who weren't allowed to come. I may have, or may have not had a picture of myself Did on that you? wall. <laughs> Anywho, so, but I wish at Blockbuster we could have done that shit. I would have taken so many pictures, so many. <laughs> My mom would have I, been one of those pictures. I wouldn't, I don't even give a shit about late fees or like that you didn't return a movie whatever because to rent again you're gonna have to pay that shit or return that shit like right i don't care it's them assholes that come in and try and alley-oop me and try and get free shit out of me and i'm like nah nah son (laughs) like the lady with the fucking coupon i don't know if i've told the story on the podcast let's do it now (laughs) so there is this lady and she 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 would get buddy buddy with like all of the dudes at the store. <laughs> and so we had these coupons and it was like one free new release rental. Like there weren't very many of those. There were a lot of like the older movies you like, could get yeah. for free. Yeah. But she had this coupon for one free new release. And it literally like in the fine print on the back, it says like one time use, like cashier needs to take it, blah, blah, blah. Well, she had be- befriended a fucking CSR who was obnoxious and I hated him anyway. Mm-hmm. And his what, name is Ari. Is, I was going to say, what's his name? What's his name? Drop that name. <laughs> I don't remember Ari. He didn't yeah. work there very long. And so she comes in one night and she gets me and she thinks she's going to pull one over <laughs> on manager jackie no no so she she's like here's my coupon and i'm like okay scan it and i put it in the drawer and she's like oh no i need that back i was like no it's a one-time use and she's like my nephew ari told me that i could use it over and over i need it back i was like well Thanks for giving me a reason to write Ari up because I will be looking into this. <laughs> but also, 
you're not getting the coupon back. And we went back and forth, back and forth and back and forth. So I was like, fine, I'll give it back to you. Took that shit out, cut out the barcode and handed her the rest of the card and threw the barcode in the trash after I cut open to like little pieces. I was like, you have a good night. She's like, who's the manager on duty right now? I'm like, I am. Nice to meet you. <laughs> and she, I would see her walk into the vestibule, see that I was working and walk back out. <laughs> like she never came while I was working again. I would have said, it looks like we're in a predicament here. But you know, if you like free movies, I would highly suggest you purchase our rewards program. <laughs> <laughs> and that yeah. would have sold a reward. <laughs> she already had rewards. That's where she got the goddamn coupon in the first place. Damn. Well, yeah. She was a bitch. Shit out of anyway, well, let's wrap that mo- this movie up, shall we? <laughs> so, Kia goes sad. Big top video kid. Very sad. His video store has gone up, <laughs> gone up in flames. We fade to white. Kiko is back at school. Back at school. Apparently they're making a movie about her kidnapping to kind of regain some of her father's wealth. A limo shows up to pick her up. She thinks it's Melvin, but the window, the privacy window rolls down and it's Vince. I would have been like, even better, baby. (laughs) (laughs) I can make this work. And then... Lo and behold, the door opens and Melvin slides in and she is so ecstatic that her skipper has returned and they're going to sail. She calls him skipper maybe because of the boat? Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I don't know. And and she's like, how did you survive? And he's like, your dad's display was very well made. And it's like this big metal monstrosity that he was able to like hide under when the explosion happened. And so they say, we going to disappear or what? And so then the closing scene is they're on Cisco's boat sailing and disappearing. And she tells him, you're the man. (laughs) And that is the big hit. (laughs) How do we feel, Danielle? (laughs) I'm glad it's over. (laughs) Jason Scott Lee was considered for the role of Melvin. And honestly, I couldn't imagine him being like a hitman, but I feel like he would have been hilarious. Yes. He was hilarious in the Jungle Book. Live action? Yeah. I never saw him. Yeah. You had me doubting myself for a second. I didn't know. I was like, I don't recall that movie yeah the 1994 version of the jungle book wait a minute oh you know what i was thinking of someone else he oh shit what that's where i know lena headley hetty from what she was the female lead in the jungle book oh ah (laughs) <laughs> says the bridge is old <laughs> anyway sorry uh, not much that, else that's it facts that's, wise that's it that's it <laughs> so that's tell them where up. they can reach us <laughs> if you if you have any comments or you want to let us know anything hit us up on social at no more late fees on instagram facebook tiktok twitter and youtube special shout out to our wonderful friend sierra for letting us know that i said showtime in our veronica mars series about where the new party down revival episodes are and it's actually stars so Ah. just want to highlight that you can watch it on stars correction corner another (laughs) another theme song fire today <laughs> the question is will you be able to remember these next no week? <laughs> none. None at all. all right jackie what is your today rating as still has a place in y2k jackie's heart but we're going two day rental i have 
I recognize this is not <laughs> as 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 good as my nostalgic heart would lead me to believe. Mm. This movie, I think I'll have fun. Like there are movies that we do and leading up to it, I think, oh, I'm going to like this movie, right? And then we do it and I'm like, garbage. But I have a really fun time creating social content for it because Mm -hmm. it has vibes, right? It's giving vibes and good times visually. Yes. There's a lot of fun things I could pull from it. So I feel like, yes, this movie will be able to give those vibes. I will be misleading the people to make them think that we love this movie because of what I'm able to do on social. But Danielle, today, same day. If I could go lower, I would. This movie, I will never watch again. (laughs) Unless I'm kidnapped. I can get my Lou Diamond Phillips in so many other ways. (laughs) Well, if you have opinions, we would love to hear them about anything. Just call in, tell us a joke or a a limerick or why the big hit is a cinematic masterpiece. 909-601 and MLF 909-601. 6016653 is our quick drop. You can twat us at the Twitters or leave a message on our podcast Spotify, Spotify for podcasts, podcasts <laughs> account <laughs> and you could be featured on a future episode. And join us next week as chaos ensues with Daddy Daycare. Well, and as always, be kind and rewind. <laughs>